All right, welcome back to the abyss. Let's start actually playing the game now that all that campaign talk is out of the way. Although, what is the situation? Well, like I said right up front, we had the choice of coming into the first level of the dungeon through the main entrance or the side entrance. I chose the side entrance because I've already found it's, it's hard enough. Although I'm playing the hard version of the side entrance, which means I have an extra bad guy to take uh, to deal with and all the doors are locked, which is going to slow us down quite a bit. All we're trying to do here is get from the entrance to the exit, although there's going to be some rough terrain we have to cross over in various spots as well. But the bad guys will be coming for us. Now, what is the story? Well, there's basically this dungeon is full of an evil cult that is trying to resurrect the demon. And so a lot of the bad guys you're going to fight in this game are humans. Guardians are, you know, these, these tough guys who have poisoned, uh, dark-tipped blow darts are de definitely the biggest danger we're going to be facing. Although there's also acolytes who actually, they really don't try to fight us. They just try to run away and raise the alarm, which raises the threat level, which can cause more bad guys to spawn and give us more trouble. There's also summoners who are very scary because they're wizards who can teleport around. And then there's the demon itself. And then there's also bone worms. Uh, erotica, or er, erotica, uh, chilean, and nests that we can destroy. Although in this particular adventure, I'm covering them up because these are really the only ones we'll have to deal with, potentially. And I'm hoping we don't even have to deal with the summoners because if, if they get a chance to show up, we're in trouble. Now, I don't think I mentioned up front. It's very important to be clear. Everything you're seeing here is prototype stuff. You know, this is all printed on you know just just paper, and you know this is actually going to be a full 3D model rondel. Is uh, apparently not just you know a board. The but the only thing that is really representative of what the real game looks like is the art of the board itself, which is quite nice as you can see. But you know this is outdated art. You can go to the uh, the game's website, which is what is it? I think it's Abyss. Yeah, abyssthegame.info.info. Uh, there's a link down in the show notes if you want to know more. If you want to see what the real game looks like. Because, of course, the game is not going to come with zombie miniatures I'm using from Zombie 15. And it's not going to use uh, you know, token markers from Runebound either. It's going to have its own stuff. So if you want to see what the real game looks like, definitely go check out the website. But... Yeah, I mean, you've seen me do prototype stuff before, so hopefully you guys have it clear. Just remember, I mean, you know, it's not going to be a teenage guitar wielding girl and a teenage, you know, dual wielding gun girl going in here. I just chose these characters because, hey, Niffle has, he's holding up a knife and she's holding up a gun. That looked the same. And Nestlin, the other character we're playing, this kind of, uh, this, this monk character who has a really long range because he has a bow staff. I figured, yeah, you know, that guitar on her is kind of like a bow or like a staff. So those are just the characters I'm using to represent. So, okay, we have come in and like I said, our sole goal is to make it out of here and take as few wounds along the way. And these guys, well, these guys are going to try and take us out. This one's going to try and run away. If this one can get to the entrance, then that's a real problem for us because it permanently raises the threat level and that will affect future sessions as well because that extra threat will not go away. So probably our number one concern when we first came in here, make sure this guy doesn't escape and, and you know pick the doors, you know get, get through these doors as fast as possible to get out. That's our sole goal. Different levels of course have more complex stuff, destroy certain things, rescue people, etc, etc. But we're ready to go. Now Niffle, the, you know, who has the special power of taking a catnap, he gets a starting hand of five cards. And see, so he's got pick lock, poison dagger, find weakness, sleight of hand, and deathly blow. Okay, and uh, Nishalim has scorched sun, call of the desert spirits, and he gets to draw five as well. Breath of the genie, spiritual energy, and eagle eye. Okay, so these are our hands of cards. We can use these cards to basically, well, if we're ever going to attack, see this has the attack symbol on it, you can use the eagle eye during an attack, and when attacking, uh, play this card to ignore other heroes for line of sight. So you're, you're, you're becomes, he's super accurate because everything blocks line of sight. Characters block line of sight of other characters, monsters block line of sight, nests block line of sight. If there were any treasure chests, I think even treasure chests block line of sight if I recall correctly. So line of sight is blocked fairly often, so being an eagle eye is pretty handy. And then all his other cards are basically just uh, um, bonus cards. For now, this one you can use the Call of the Desert Spirits to add four to anything you're trying, four action points, anything you're trying to do for any action. The Eagle Eye can only be used when you're attacking. The Scorched Sun can be used when you're doing a special action, when you're attacking, or when you're defending. 
Let's see, and the Thief over here has Deathly Blow, which is only for attacking, and it adds one action point plus you draw a reaction card, so you don't know exactly how good that blow is going to be. It could be anywhere from five to negative one when you draw one of these reaction cards. Slide of Hand you can only use when you're moving or doing special, but it adds four, so that's going to be really handy for picking locks. We'll use the Slide of Hand when we're picking locks. Find Weakness you can use when you're doing a special action or attacking, and this is another one like the Deathly Blow. It's just like a more flexible version of the Deathly Blow. Poison Dagger. Uh, you can use this for anything, and it gives you two plus you know, a, a, a random value added to anything you're trying to attempt. And then, oh, pick lock. Is the master of breaking and entering when picking a lock, draw two response cards to determine, all, and only have to do one. So this makes all lock picks half as easy as they normally are. So that's pretty handy, and you use this when you're doing movement actions. Now I keep talking about doing movement actions. How does this game work? Well. I think I've told you enough about the hand. Let's just actually start playing. Here's what a play... First of all, we can choose. I could go first, and then Jen, or Jen could go first. Every round, the heroes all do their actions, and then the monsters do their actions, and then the heroes do, and then the monsters do, and that's how it keeps going. And I think, since I am in front, and I want to get over here and pick this door, and I think you can see it just right there. You know, it's a locked door. I want to pick this door as fast as possible so we can rush off and kill this acolyte before he gets away because that's going to be bad news. I think we'll have me go first. So I got, what I got to do this round is run over here, try to pick this lock, open it up, and then get out of the way of the monk so the monk can go through and get to the guy. Because not only do we lock line of sight, I mean, we physically can't move through each other as well. So you, you have to you know do some dancing to get to him. But chasing after this guy means we'll have to deal with all these guys because that's who he's running towards. Okay, so that's what we're going to try and do. So I know what I want to do right from the get-go is move over here and pick the lock. Picking the lock is a thing you can do while you're moving, basically. So how do I do my action? Well, the first thing I do on my turn is I come down here to the, oh, what's it called? The Rock of Fate, I think? It's basically a rondelle. Or the Rock of Destiny, that's what it's called. This is a rondelle, like, say, Navigador, or, you know, Antique, or any Matt Gertz game. And this is my stone, because I am the blue player, and Jen's pink stone is over here. And in a two-player game, and only a two-player game, you put this ghost stone as well. And as part of setup, this was the first space occupied, the second space, third space. If we had more players, more spaces would be occupied. Just going around the, the rock, or the Wheel of Destiny, or whatever it's called. So, it's my turn. The first thing I do is, I have to pick up my stone. I, you know, I started out here on my aim shot. I cannot do an aim shot. So I have to pick this up and use action points. And at the beginning of the game, since I'm at full health, I have eight action points to spend. So I have to spend action points to move this around the rondel to get on a space that lets me do what I want. So, I mean, right now, the very next space is move. So if I just come over here, I can pick this up, put it here, and now that cost me one of my eight action points to jump over to this space. And, you know, so, so just like that, I only have seven action points left. But if I choose this space, I can draw a card, and, you know, so I'll have more cards in my hand. I can have up to seven in my hand at any time. I get to draw a card, and then I get to move. And during movement, that's when I can also pick locks. Now, if I wanted, I could spend more action points. If, if I didn't want to land on the move space, and I didn't want to land on the special space, maybe I want to come over here to sprint, because that lets me move even further. Instead of getting to draw a card and then move, I get to move, but I get extra action points by drawing a one of these events, and you know, find, or the reaction cards, and find out how much total action points I have to spend for my move. But the thing is, to be able to get, to do to do this only costs one action point. To do this, normally, if Jen and the Ghost Player weren't here, it would cost me one, two, three, four. Four of my eight action points would be spent activating this action, and then I'd only have four action points to actually do what I wanted to do. On the flip side, coming here, only spent one, so I have seven action points to spend on the move. So that's definitely what I'm going to do. So, I'm going to move. I, I pick up, I move over here, I've spent my first action point. Now, first of all, I get to draw another card. And having more cards, there's some agility. And now this is a, I can use my agility anytime I, for any action, and when I do it, I'll also get to draw another card. So that's actually pretty cool. So I've got now seven action points left. Let's go on ahead and start moving. Every action point spent is a move. So one, two, so, 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 all right. So, right, I, I, so I've already, I have eight total. I've spent one, and now I'm going two, three, four, five. So I've spent five of my eight total action points. I'm at the door. Now, I can spend the last three of my action points to attempt to pick the lock on this door. But 
Um, what I'll have to do is I have to decide how many action points I'm going to devote to this action of my remaining three, because I've used up five of my three just to get there. And then I'm going to have to draw two reaction cards. And if the total number of action points I'm willing to spend is greater than the sum of these two cards. And again, these cards, most of the time, most of these cards have a value of two. I, I think almost a third of this deck are two. So it's generally a pretty safe bet that these two cards combined equals four. So I really need to have five action points if I want to have a good chance of picking this lock. Okay. But, um, you know, and, and so I'm not really feeling very good about that because I've only got three action points left. So that's not good. But what I can do is, because I'm doing a move action, I can play cards that are allowed during movement, like my pick lock. My pick lock is allowed to be played during movement. So I could play this, and remember, normally I have to draw two cards and beat the sum. With the pick lock, I, only, I draw two, but I only have to pay attention to one of them. So it's, I, I'll very likely pick this lock. And, let's see, if I, you know, because the thing is, in this whole deck, I think there are two fives. And if I draw a five, that's going to be really, really tough. It's a real long shot. If I want to throw a little bit more my way to help ensure that I'll pick this lock, I could say, use my, I could throw, I could play my poison dagger as well, which means I'd have two more action points. Currently, I've got three, but if I play this, I, dis, you know, I discard it, I've got five action points plus whatever this card says. And then I've got a ton of action points. And here's the interesting thing. After I'm done picking my lock, I want to make sure I have some action points left so I can move out of the way. Because otherwise, if I just stand here, I'm in the way of the monk and he won't be able to come over here to chase after. So I want to make sure, I don't want to use all my action points, so I'm going to have to give up some cards. So first of all, I'm definitely going to play pick lock. And now that means when I pick the lock, I draw two, but I only take the lesser. So it's going to be much easier to pick this lock. And um, but even still, I have to decide how much of my remaining action points am I going to spend on this. And so I think, let's see here. You know, I'm gonna go on ahead and use this sleight of hand. I'm gonna play that as well because I'm in movement. Remember, I'm doing move. So that means I can play this. I can play this during move or during a special. And so that adds four more action points. I was at three, but now I'm up to seven. I have seven action points remaining. And I wanna have at least like one, two, so I can get out of the way so that the monk can get through. So I've got seven total. Oh, that's way overkill. I don't need... Well, but I could walk on... I could actually. Wow. So, all right. How many... If, 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 once this is opened... Well, actually, one thing. I have to spend one action point once it's picked just to open the door. So, to be able to move, I need one, two, three, four to get over to this door. So, I'd like to have four action points left for when I go through that door. So, um, so I'm, I'm in a position to start picking this lock while the monk moves up. So, that's a pretty good move. So, I need four more after I'm done. If I play this, I've got seven. So that means I could say, I'm devoting three of my remaining action points to trying to pick the lock. And then I'm feeling pretty good that I, I won't fail because I've got this. Now, if I want, I can discard some more cards just to be sure. Because what if I draw a four or a five? You know? But I'm going to draw two cards, and I'm only going to have to do one of them. But you know what? Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to throw, a I'm going to throw another card in just to raise my action points a little bit more. But I'm not going to play any of my cards. I've already played two of my cards. Jen is going... Well, no. Here's the thing. Jen can assist me by playing her cards as well. So she could throw four points my way. But here's the problem. The distance between us limits how much she can help me. Because we're so far away from each other, even though she'd like to call the Desert Spirits and help me for four points, that would be four minus one, two, three, four. Since there were, there's um, five points, I mean, actually, none of it would get through. You can really, a player can only assist another player if they're close to each other. And since we're separated, Jen can't really assist me right now. So it's all on me. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play one more. I'm going to play Agility. And this has the special power of letting me draw another card immediately. So I've got some Stealth, which will help me hide from monsters. So that means I... St All right, so I was at seven. Now I have a total of eight action points remaining. I'm going to spend four of my eight to attempt to pick the lock. And so, I'm spending four, and after that I'll have four more. I only get one shot at this, and so now I'm going to draw two cards and see what the, what, the, what the lock throws at us. And a one, okay, I way overpaid, and a three. All right, so because of my lock picking, I'm going to ignore this three. That just gets discarded, and I'm going to have to beat the one. I beat it easily, and unfortunately I overpaid. Now see, if, 
If, um, if, if I had to deal with both of these, I would have needed four, I would have needed five action points left to do it. But fortunately, my pick lock let me get through it easier. So um, I beat that, and so I spent four of my remaining eight. I've got four more, so I'll open the door. That's one, two, three, four, and now I'm in position to start picking this lock next turn. And that was it. That was all happened from my one move. I spent some of my action points to get up to the door. I discarded some cards to get some more. I picked the lock. I, well, I, I, I'm gonna say I got lucky because I used my pick locking, so I pretty much had it in the bag. And now I'm in position and my turn is over. I can't do anything else. And actually the way that's represented, this is actually gonna be a real 3D molded rock. Um, and all these little holes are pegs and we each have a peg and you take your peg and you rotate it to towards the center to indicate that your turn is over but obviously I don't have any of that stuff right now I'm just doing prototypes but my turn is over and now it is the monk's turn and the monk um, wants to blow through here as fast as possible and chase this fling acolyte now the monk is starting out at five hit points the monk is going to get six action points they could spend. To get to that fleeing guy, she needs to spend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Although, actually, no, not quite, because the monk has a range of three. Uh, you know, because he's got this really long bow staff as represented by this guitar. So, um, one, two, three. So the monk only has to get here, and then the bow, the, the staff could actually reach this far. One, two, three. Yeah, the range is far enough. So the monk just has to get there to start hitting. But the closer he gets, I mean, this guy is going to run away, so probably want to get closer. But anyway, at the very least, you need to move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But here's the problem. You can see there's a symbol here. That means rubble. And that means it takes one extra action point to move into a rubble space. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the monk needs eight action points worth of movement to get over there. And here's the problem. The monk is starting out here on the move space. And so, um, you know, the monk can't stay here. The monk has to move to another thing. So I think the monk is going to sprint. So, because the ghost is blocking the special space, nobody can come to the special space. There's only one peg hole. So we skip this one, two. You can see up to two heroes can be sprinting in a round. So we spent two of our six action points. We're down to four. We have four action points. But we can spend those action points, plus we get to draw one card and add that. And now, fingers crossed, I'm hoping to draw a four. Show me a four. Show me a four. Boink. There is only one of these in the entire deck. Oh my gosh. A three. So I did have four, but instead I only have three now. I mean, it could have been five, or it could have been, shoot, or one, or... There, there's the five I wanted, but no, I got a negative one. So, crap. Okay. Well, so I spent, um, right, so I got one, two, three because of that. That was a bit of bad luck. And now, so I've got three action points left. Let's start moving. One, two, because of the rubble. Three. That's not very good. I think I want to start using some more cards to pump that up. I'm going to call upon the desert spirits to give me four more action points. One, two, three, four, because the door is still open. You can actually close doors as well if you're being chased and you want to slow down the people who are chasing you. And in fact, actually, the, the monsters of the dungeon, which are kind of like a scary insectoid race, if you close a door, the monsters can't get through you, but get through a door, but the, the humans are smart enough to open doors. So we just need one more step. And so I got to give up another card for, um, but here's the problem. All this sprinting got us there, but we're not going to get to attack because I didn't pick up the rock and move over here to attack. Now, if I could, I mean, I could have actually, instead of coming to sprint, I could have spent two more action points and come down here to charge. And that means I get to move and then I get to attack afterwards. Oh, you know what? I think that would have been smarter. Let's see. If I had started here on move and, okay, one, two, three, four, I spent four of my six um, action points. And that means I did not draw this negative one. Right, so, because I do want to be able to attack. Right, so, I, uh, of my six action points, I just spent four to be able to charge. Now, that meant I got to go one, two. That was not far enough. So I call upon the spirits of the, de the, the, the desert spirits, and I get to go one, two, three, four more. And then, I call upon, let's see, now a charge counts as a move and an attack. So I can use the Scorched Sun because it's an attack card. Um, or I could use the, the Breath of Genius. Well, I'll just call upon some spiritual energy. That gives me two more. One, two. Now I'm in range. Okay. And I could spend some more. 
uh, action cards, but I'm already running out of cards. And you know, card management, hand management is a huge part of this game. It's absolutely essential that you hold on to cards to be able to defend yourself and pump up other actions as well. Although it's interesting, now that I'm next to Jen, Jen could sacrifice some of her cards to help me out without any penalty because we're right next door to each other. So that's actually pretty cool. So, uh, am I gonna charge any more? Uh, let's see, I could move two steps forward, but the thing is, as it stands right, well actually as it stands right now, I'm already in the line of sight of these bad guys if they want to attack me, because it's a really cool feature of the game. There are these arrow slits. If these guys, the, the guards of this world, they have poison darts that they shoot at you. And so if this guy just moves up here to this arrow slit, he can shoot at both me and Jen. So that's going to be a problem a little later on. So I'm in trouble anyway. You know what? I think I will move a little bit closer. Um, although the guy only has one hit point. If I hit him now, I'll beat him. No, I'm not going to move any farther. I don't want to spend any more cards. I've already spent two cards just to move this far. And so, my charge is over. And once I'm done moving, any action points I had left over, I would not be able to spend them. Um, you know, they wouldn't be able to carry over, but I've used them all up, I've moved here, and now I get to attack this guy. Because remember, I've got an incredibly long reach with this staff. One, two, three. So I'm going to attack the guy. Now, my default attack is three. The default defense of an acolyte is one. But when I attack him, he's going to get to draw one of these cards. And this could be anything from negative one, as you saw, to a five. Now, it's most likely going to be a two. Second most likely, it'll be a one or a three. So if I really want to hedge my bets and assume I'm going to get a three, let's just say, that means he'll have a total defense of four, which means I need to have an attack of five. And now I can pump up this attack by spending more cards. I'm already a three. If I give up the, the Breath of the Genie, that'll give me the five I need to probably, and then I'll still have Scorched Sun, and I'll still have Eagle Eye. But here's the problem. The Breath of the Genie, I can use for any action. So I really should save this, because maybe I'm going to have to defend myself, and I want to defend myself more. So, but I, well, I can use this while I'm defending also. Let's see here. No, I, okay, I will go on ahead and just use the Breath of Genie then, because this is going to help me for attack and defense later. It won't help me for movement. See, I could use this to move if I really need to move farther as well. Because that's the crux of this game. The game itself is very, very simple. You move on the wheel, you do an action. The other player moves on the wheel, do the action, and then the bad guys move on the wheel, and they do their actions. But the, the real interesting part of the game is hand management. Keeping the right cards in your hand for the right time. Also, because at the end of your turn, you don't get to redraw cards. You only get to draw cards every once in a while. So if you run out of cards, you're in trouble. Um, but I do want to ensure I do not miss this guy because I don't want to have to go chasing after him. If I, I want to kill him right now. He only has one hit point. If I get a hit, he's gone. So I don't want to mess around. So I want to give up a card. Or since Jen's right next to me, do I have her give up a card? Let's see here. Because uh, she could give up her Deathly Blow and that's one plus a uh, random number. So that could work out pretty well. And you know, currently, and then we both have three cards in our hand. And you know, and Jen, I don't think she's really planning on fighting much. She's just trying to get through, pick these locks, and get out really quickly. And you know, this is our the monk is our main powerhouse fighter. So you know what? I think rather than lose any more of Nestlin's cards, Jen will assist with this attack by playing one of her cards. So now the attack was going to be a three, but now it's a four plus one card. It's a five. Oh, that's not great. It's a five. Okay. Now, we're going to pump it up anymore. Jen could pump up some more. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Whenever you're assisting, it's um, the total you have minus the distance, and there is a distance of one. So, it, we, I mean, you know, um, this was what it was, but minus the distance of one, because we're next to each other, means that I've only bumped up one. So, the attack is going to be four. Ah, <sighs> crap. Really would have liked to have drawn a better card than that. That's kind of bad. Four is kind of risky. Kind of risky. I'd really like to have at least a five. So, I think, I think, I, I think the thief will throw a little bit more help in. We'll throw in the uh, find weakness. So, that means we're, we're up to a five now, and we get to draw another card, and we don't suffer any more penalties. We've already paid the distance penalty, and it's another one! Oh, come on! So, it's a six. So, ne Neshim, with his, his baseline of three, uh, assisted by my finding a weakness and throwing a deathly blow in, has gone up to a six. And attacking this guy, let's see what happens. His defense is one plus two is a three. Okay, he's been beaten, fine. He is not going to escape. The threat doesn't go up. 
And that was it. And I went through a few more cards. That was maybe overkill, but I didn't want to take the chance of missing. All right. <clears throat> So the heroes are almost done. Now in a two player game, each hero has a stone on the Rock of Destiny and there's also a ghost stone. Every round you have to move them as well. And you, and you saw how this, this being here actually helped because it meant that, remember, Jen started out over here. She got to skip this because it was blocked by the rock. So she only had to pay one, two, three to start her charge. If the rock hadn't been here, she would have had to pay one, two, three, four. So she had, you know, more action points to spend on her charge. But anyway, now the, the, the ghost player has to move as well and can move up to five spaces. And really what we want to do is we want to move it into a position that's going to benefit us next turn. Uh, let's see. I think we are next turn. Let's see. Well, the interesting thing is, what do we want to do next turn? I know that I, the, the blue player, I'm just going to want to move so I can try to pick the lock. The closest I can do to that is a sprint, which means I'm going to have to spend, if, if, the, if the dummy player moves only here, it's going to cost me one, two to get there so I can spend more on the sprint. Otherwise, if, you know, if I skip the sprint, I'd have to come down here to the charge to be able to pick the lock. So I think I'm definitely going to want to go to the sprint. So I could just move him here so that he'll stay in position and make it cheaper for me so I have more action points to spend on picking this lock. Or I can move him farther, say over here, because I don't think neither of us really have to rest right now. Resting means you take your discard pile and you reshuffle and you draw. Well, actually, we did just lose a bunch of cards. And it might be worthwhile to rest to get, a, to get our hand back up before the bad guys come for us. So actually, I think I don't want to block rest. So I think the, the dummy will just move from special to attack because you know, it has to move at least one and that's okay because the thief isn't going to try and attack the thief's going to try and pick this lock so it's going to stay here and make it cheaper and so i'm going to try and sprint which will let me pick the lock and next turn the monk is probably just going to rest probably going to rest so that he can draw back up um well he's only drawn back up to five Hmm. Well, I think we'll wait and see if he's going to rest, but maybe if he's feeling good about it, if bad guys are moved into position, maybe he'll go for an aim shot instead. Um, you know, I'm sorry, not an aim shot, a bash. We'll see how that goes. Hmm. Well, okay, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, we're done. Everybody's moved, and now it is the bad guy's turn. And so we draw a card to see how far the bad guys are going to move on their rondelle. And they're only moving one space. Okay, that's not too bad. So... If I had just drawn a three, we take the target and go one, two, three, and then that means we activate this and do what it says. Everybody attacks, we spawn, and then we would move. So that's why you've got these two rocks on here so you can keep track. But as it is, we only have to move forward one. So the target moves up and then we move towards the target, and hey, we're only doing one. The only thing that's happening right now is an attack. And we got lucky. Having a one means um, right now the only thing bad guys want to do is attack, but nobody can attack. This guy, they have, let's see, what is the range on these guardians? Their range is three. This guy is too far away. This guy can't, you know, shoot through the door. He's too far away. This guy has one, two, mm. well, this guy has a wall in between him, as does this guy. So they are all going to have to move before they, so we got a lucky break. They're not going to move for a little bit. We have some more time. But, you know, if I had drawn a four, they would have tried to attack, but couldn't. Then they would have spawned some more bad guys. Then they would have moved. Then they would have attacked. Then they would have moved again. So you can never be sure exactly how much they're gonna do in one given turn. But we got lucky, because we only drew a one. Okay, so it is now back to our heroes. We get to go some more. And, let's see, I think we'll go on ahead and have me start out with, as planned, I have to spend, or remember, I, have it. I haven't been hurt yet. The more I get hurt, the less action points I get. I haven't been hurt, so I get eight action points. I'm gonna spend one, two, and so I'm gonna sprint. And so I've got six action points left, but it, remember, when you sprint, you get to draw, so it's gonna be six plus zero, come on! Oh, you hate me, deck. So it's only six. So now, I could spend all six trying to pick this lock, and that's actually pretty good, getting through these two locks so quickly. And you know, we kinda got, we dodged a bullet. Um, but, do I want to only, say, use four and then save the rest of my six action points to actually move in here? But if I move in here, I'm just going to run right into this guy, and I'm not as good a fighter as Jen. Um, so maybe I just want to pick the lock, but then stay close to Jen. Now, what I know is the bad guys, at the very least, they're probably going to spawn, maybe move, and if we get lucky, they won't attack. So we have kind of a breather. We could just make a run for it. Hmm. 
And so maybe it is a good time. Maybe I should just go on ahead, pick the lock, and, and you know not really move. Just go with a six. A six is pretty much guaranteed. I don't have to pump it up with any additional stuff. It's guaranteed. I'll stay here, and then Jen will rest, so she'll get a big hand of cards, and then we'll start trying to make a move. That makes pretty much sense. Let's go with that. So I, uh, I've, I've got six total, and so I'm just going to use all six. I'm not going to play any additional cards. Jen could help me. She could play cards as well because she's right next to me, but we're not going to. I'm just going to go with the six. Now, when you pick a door, you have to draw two and add it up. So let's see if that six is enough. <gasps> oh dear, that's not good. Show me a one. I failed, I failed to pick the lock. And now it's too late. You have to commit. If I had just committed one more card, because the thing is you can commit your cards face up for whatever their value is. So I could have used my dagger to help me, but you can commit any card face down and that always adds plus one. Even if you know it's a card that wouldn't normally be able to be used. Like, you know, Jen could have committed her Desert Eagle face down. because Even though I'm not doing combat, it still would have applied. But, oh gosh, oh, that was terrible. So my whole turn, the, the, the deck went against me, and so I failed. I spent all of that, and I got nothing for it. But at least I didn't waste any cards on it. All right, anyway, though, Jen, she's just going to rest. Now, that cost her one action point. And this is kind of wasteful. She has five action points left, but they're not going to do anything for her. But she will now be able, within resting, to you know take her discard pile, shuffle it back in. I'm not going to shuffle it too terribly hard. Let's just shuffle a little bit. That'll be good. That's enough shuffling and gets to draw back up to a full hand of, you know, back, draw it back up to five. All right, so we've got some active defenses and some inner strength. And so that was it. So we, we took it easy. We, we kind of slowed down and I failed epically. That was terrible. And now the ghost has to move. Let's see here. Now the bad guys are coming for us. I think next turn, am I going to try, if I, if I want to pick the lock again, I'm going to have to move over here to charge. And then I could, um, you know, put everything into trying to pick the lock again. Or I could move over here to defend and try to defend myself in case they come for me. But um, I think I think I'm just going to try and pick this lock again. So we're going to have the ghost just move here. The ghost moves here, and that means next turn I only have to pay one because I can skip defend because the ghost is here and come straight to charge. So um, I'll be able to put a lot of action points into picking the lock again. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And so everybody's done. Very simple turn. And now the bad guys are going to go in. Let's see what they're up to. A three. That's not good. Okay. So one, two, three. The bad guys, first of all, they are going to spawn. And now this, they're going to spawn equal to the current threat level. At the beginning of the game, the threat level was set to the level of the dungeon plus the number of players. So uh, um, is it set to three. Right now, that means only one person is going to spawn from this group. As we continue around, when we get over here, one guy will spawn from this group over here. So, and it's our choice. We can spawn another guard. We can spawn a, you know, a, a summoner, which are the absolute worst. Or we could spawn another runner, another acolyte. I think I don't want any more guards, so we're just going to spawn an acolyte. The place for the humans, for the for the. Cult members to spawn are these little trap doors. So he's going to come out over here. And actually, it doesn't come out on the spot. It comes out on a spot adjacent. First of all, all the if multiples were going to spawn from here, first you would fill all of the orthogonals, then you would fill the diagonals, and then if more were going to spawn, because you know as the threat gets up, I mean, it could get really high. You might have a bunch of guys spawning. But as it is, we get to choose, and I think I'm going to spawn it back as far as possible, so it's going to take a while to run. And now this guy, all he's going to do is try and run for the exit, because if he does, he raises the threat level. So. Um, we spawned, and it wasn't too bad. It was only one. Now, all the bad guys are going to move. Here they come. Now, we go in order. First, we had any bone worms, they would go. Then the acolyte goes. Then the guardians. Then the summoners. So they always go in this order. And so the acolyte's going to run. He's got a speed of two, I believe, and he always runs towards the nearest alarm, which in this level is the exit. But, you know, it could be like a physical thing that he's just trying to raise the alarm. But anyway, so he gets to move two. One, two. He's just going to always move the fastest. He's going to run straight. Now, he can't get through us. But he will still run up, and he can attack, and he'll fight to get past us so he can get to the exit. So he's coming. Now all the guards move, and we do them. The guards who are ranged attackers only move as close as they need to be to be in range. So this guy, he only has to move one because now he's at this arrow slit, and whenever you're right up next to an arrow slit, you can shoot at anybody with a 90 degree. So this guy standing here can shoot at all, uh, all six of these spaces. So this guy's going to start shooting at us pretty soon. Now this guy, what would, uh, let's see, this guy, he's just going to go one, two, how far do they move? They move three, one, two, three. He's just going to start moving around. Now the interesting thing is, if this guy's going to come to us, 
he will, he has the keys. He can just open the door. I don't have to worry about pick locking. If we just let this guy come up and open the door for us. Right, and now this guy is gonna move into position. One, two, three, and his range is one, two, three. So he can't shoot us. This guy can shoot us, and this guy, if he moves up here, he can't. So he's gonna to have to go one, two, three. And now, does he have line of sight? No, he still doesn't have line of sight with either. Or Yes, he does. He does have line of sight with me. So this guy can shoot at me. This guy can shoot at either of us, but they'll always shoot at the closest target they can. So we're both gonna get shot at. And yikes. And unfortunately, neither of us are defending. The ghost player is defending. So here we go. Because, oh yeah, so everybody's moved, right? Everybody moved, and now, they're all gonna attack. This guy's not gonna attack, he's out of range. This guy's not gonna attack. This guy, who can only attack somebody next to him, is not gonna attack, but both of these guys are gonna attack. This one's gonna go for me, because there's no line of sight, and this one's gonna go for Jen, because Jen is closer. Right, now, the bad guys, basically, they have a basic attack value of, you see these guards, have a two. But they, it's a two plus they draw one card. So it's usually, if you assume on average you're gonna be drawing twos, they're gonna be hitting us with fours. And so that means we have to have a defense of four to avoid them. But if, if they get lucky, they might have bigger hits. Now, my default defense is two. Jen's is three. And we can sacrifice more cards to pump that up right now. You know, Jen could sacrifice her Scorched Sun and turn her three into a six. You know, and actually, although, no, Jen could sacrifice her Eagle Eye, but since it, it, it does, it's not a defending card, she would have to sacrifice it face down, so it would only add plus one. But, let's see, so these are both good ones to sacrifice. I could sacrifice my stealth card, I could play my stealth card, which until the start of the next turn, monsters are not considered you the weakest or closest hero unless you are the only hero they could possibly attack. Now, that doesn't really, I mean, weakness is a thing. If monsters have multiple characters who are equidistant, they then go for the weakest, which is based on hit points. And currently, I've got, I am the weakest character. And so, if I use stealth, suddenly I'm not the weakest character. But that doesn't matter right now because we don't have, everybody knows who they're going to attack. So using stealth won't save me. But I could discard it to add plus one, so I have three defense. But I could use my poison, poison dagger, which gives me two plus something else. You know, which hopefully would be something. So I might get up to five or six defense. And here's the thing, if I take a hit, it drops down, now I only get six action points, I still have the same range, um, but I have less defense for the future, and what's worse is, I get a wound card that gets permanently added to my deck, which clogs my deck up, you know, can you know, cause really bad problems at the worst time. So, we want to avoid getting wounded if at all possible. It's probably worth sacrificing some cards to avoid this hit. And of course, you know, Jen's got a couple cards, but then if we sacrifice these cards for defense, we don't have them to pump up our offense anymore. Now, fortunately, whenever you move or attack, you get to draw a card. Whenever you defend, you get to draw a card, but that's only one card at a time. So we can spend cards a lot faster than we can get them. And um, so we're in a bit of trouble right now. And I think that looks like a pretty good place to stop right there. And if you'd like to watch them extend it as we continue to try to get out alive, um, you can go in and hit the little eye up in the top right corner of the screen to go to the extended playthrough and see how well we survived this attack. Or you can go to Final Thoughts. Your choice in five, four, three, two, one.